Okay, today we start with our second chapter on electricity, chapter 22, which is about the concept of the electric field. In the last chapter, chapter 21, we saw that the electrostatic force between two-pointed charges is given by Coulomb's law. It's proportional to uh, the magnitudes of the forces, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the two charges. Here is a peculiar question. How does Q1 know about the presence of Q2? For them to interact, they have to know about the presence of each other and therefore start interacting. How does the charge Q1 know about the presence of Q2 to interact with it through this force? Well, the answer to this can be clarified by an example from the animal kingdom, and that is the spider. What does the spider do? Well, it makes a web and then sits at the center of the web waiting for a prey, a small insect. When a small insect comes and gets strangled in the web, it will send, the web will send small vibrations. These vibrations will travel like a wave until they reach the spider. When the spider senses these vibrations, it knows that there is a prey, a prey at that point, so it immediately goes there and attacks that prey and eats it or do whatever it likes to do with it. Electric charges behave like spiders. The electric charge sits around itself instead of the web of the spider. It sits what we call an electric field, invisible lines that are set by this pointed charge. And it is through this electric field that the pointed charge senses the presence of other electrical objects. It, it will only detect electrical phenomena around itself. So the charge sets up an electric field E around itself. The electric field is a vector quantity, so it has magnitude and direction. We will see how to calculate the magnitude and how to determine the direction of the electric field. But we can say qualitatively that the magnitude set up of the, of the electric field set up by the charge Q1 at point P should be proportional to the distance between that point and the charge. As the distance increases, the electric field decreases. <clears throat> it's like the intensity of sound waves that we studied in chapter 17. It diminishes as the distance increases. So here we have the same concept. As the distance from the charge increases, the electric field it produces will decrease in intensity. The direction of the electric field at any point in space is determined by the sign of Q, which will dictate whether it is repulsive or attractive electric field. So this is what the first charge does. It sets up an electric field around itself. Therefore, when the second charge Q2 is placed at any point P around the first charge Q1, the electric force on this charge is determined by the electric field that is set up by the first one. So here is what we will do. In chapter 22, we have two lectures. In the first lecture today, we want to see how to calculate the electric field that is produced by point charges. In the next lecture, we will do the opposite. We have an electric field that is already set up somehow. We want to bring a point charge, place it in this electric field, and we want to see what is the effect of the electric field on this point charge that is placed inside it. So today, let's start with section one, in which we want to discuss the electric field and find the electric field that is produced by a point charge. We can define the electric field at some point P in space around the charged object <coughs> in the following way. Place a positive tested charge Q0 at point P. So here is the situation. I have a charged object, okay, it is a charge. 
If it is uncharged, we don't care about it. It doesn't produce an electric field. This charged object, whatever its shape is, will produce electric field around itself. So we want to find the electric field produced by this object at some point, like point P here, okay, at this point. What is the electric field at this point that is produced by this object? To do that, we bring a positive tested charge, let's call it Q0, and place it at the point, this point here, where we want to find the electric field. The tested charge is like a torch, okay? It's like when you look for something in the dark using a torch. So this is the torch there. We take this torch, go around, and calculate the electric field at any point that is set up by this object. <laughs> then, once we place the positive tested charge at the point where we want to find the electric field, we measure the, electric, the electrostatic force on this tested charge. So we place the, the tested charge here. The tested charge is at this point here, okay? And here is the object that produce the electric field at that point. So we bring our positive tested charge, place it at the point where we want to find the electric field. Then once we do that, we find the electrostatic force acting on the tested charge which is placed here due to the electric field that is produced by this charged object. And then the electric field, that's the electric force, the electric field at this point is defined as the force that we measure on the tested charge at this point divided by the tested charge itself. So the tested charge basically is like a gist. We bring it, measure something, and then get rid of it. At the end of the day, it will not appear in any equation. It's like a catalyst, so to speak, in chemical reactions. And as we will see, it will disappear at the end when we calculate the electric field. From here, this is the definition of the electric field. You can see that the SI unit of the electric field is Newton per Coulomb. The magnitude of the electric field is equal to the force that we measure over Q0. Its direction is the same as the direction of the force. Why? Because we chose the tested charge to be positive. So here is a positive number, a vector divided by a positive number, as we studied in physics 101, will not change the direction of the vector. So the electric field will have the same direction as the electrostatic force on the tested charge Q0. Note that the field exists regardless of Q0. Q0 is like a torch. It's like when you are in a treasury cave, cave huh? It's full of treasures. The treasures are there. Whether you are there or not, whether you bring a torch or not, whether you bring a lamp, LED, what have you, the treasures are there. It's just what you use to look for this treasure. What we use to look for the electric field is Q0. So it's like when you take a thermometer and go around the room to measure the temperature at every point of the room. The temperature is not produced by the thermometer. It is produced by the atmosphere, by the environment, by that season in the year, by ACs, whatever is the cause of the temperature in the room. The thermometer is just a tool to measure the temperature. Likewise, the tested charge will not appear in the end equation of the electric field. It is just a tool to measure the strength of the electric field at a given point. One final point to watch, and that is the tested charge, besides being positive, it should be as small as possible. It should be a particle, really. But if it is not a particle, it should be a very small particle. Because you can see why. Suppose that this is the object that is producing the electric field. If Q0 is small, it will not affect the charge distribution in the object. But if Q itself is large, then <clears throat> it will affect, see, the charges in the object will see this positive charge and they will be repelled. So it will distort the charge distribution of the object for which the electric field is to be determined.
Now let us talk about electric field lines. Electric field lines are curves that indicate the direction of the electric field. This is why we need them. They are very nice way to see the electric field pictorially, visually, okay? Here is an example of an electric field line associated with a certain charge distribution. So the curvature, the direction of the electric field line tells me the electric field direction at that point because at any point in space, the electric field is tangent. The electric field line is not the electric field. The electric field is tangent to the electric field line, which is this curve at any point in space. The more lines we have, the stronger is the electric field. So they can give us a fair idea about the magnitude and the direction of the electric field. Electric field lines are related to the magnitude and direction of the electric field. The number of electric field lines per unit area through a surface perpendicular to the electric field is proportional to the strength of the electric field in that region. So we have here an object, whatever its shape is, it is charged, so it produces electric field around itself. And these are, these red lines, are the electric field lines associated with this object. Now, bring in a surface, which is the green surface here, of unit area, one meter square, or one centimeter square. And use it like a torch, like the torch, like the Q0. Place it in different regions around the charged object and see how many electric field lines penetrate this unit surface in a perpendicular manner. As the number of electric field lines through this surface increases, the strength of the electric field increases. As the number is small, that means we have a region of weak electric field. So here we have a very strong electric field. See how many lines? One, two, three, four. Whereas here, we have a weaker electric field because we only have two electric field lines penetrating that same unit area. So the electric field lines is large when the electric, uh, the electric field is large when the electric field lines are close together, like here, when they are densely populated, and small when the electric field lines are far apart. Now let's look at some rules involving electric field lines. The first rule, which is about the direction. Electric field lines must begin, emerge from, exit from positive charges, and terminate or end on negative charges. The reason is very simple. If I bring a positive tested charge and place it at this point, the positive tested charge will see this positive charge and it will be repelled from it. So that's the direction of the electric field. Whereas if I bring the positive tested charge, place it at this point <coughs> where now we have a negative charge producing the field, the positive tested charge will see the negative charge and it will be attracted to it. So the electric field will be toward the negative point of charge. Rule number two, the number of lines drawn leaving a positive charge or approaching a negative charge is proportional to the magnitude of the charge, as we said before. So here, regardless of the directions of the, of the, directions of the arrows, See how many lines, how many, the number of lines, how many lines surround this charge and how many lines surround this one. You can see that we have more lines here than we have here. So our conclusion is this is a stronger charge than this one. Indeed, as you can see the numbers, the magnitude of this charge is double the magnitude of that one. Since it is positive, the field lines are going away since this is negative, the electric field lines are approaching or terminating on that charge. The third rule is that no two electric field lines can cross because we said that the electric field lines are tangent. Sorry, the electric field is tangent to the electric field lines. So if we have, what if we have the opposite of this? If these are two electric field lines, if they intersect, what does it mean? It means that at this point in space, at this point in space, the electric field will have two directions. That is impossible. A given vector at one point in space 
at the same instant of time cannot have two directions. So to avoid that, we say that electric field lines never cross each other. They either go parallel to each other or they diverge away from each other. They can never cross. Now let us look at some examples of important electric field lines that we will encounter frequently in our study of electricity. We have already mentioned some of them. These are the electric field lines associated with a positive charge. They are pointing away from the charge. So we say that they are radially, look at that, they are along a radius and outward, away from the charge. The electric field lines associated with a positive charge are radially outward. The electric field lines associated with a negative charge are radially, again, they are along the radius, but inward, toward the charge. Radially outward, radially inward. If I have two similar charges, equal in magnitude, and they have the same sign, you can imagine what is happening here. In the region between them, I have strong repulsion. So I create a region of almost zero electric field in between them. They cancel each other. On the far side of each charge, they behave just like the original pointed charges. They are not distorted here or there. If instead they have opposite charges, one positive and one negative, see how it behaves. I have a strong attraction now between the two charges. So in the region between the two charges, I have a strong electric field and away from the charges, they again behave almost like pointed charges. Indeed, this structure here is called an electric dipole. And this is something we will study at the end of this lecture. Another important uh, object that we will encounter frequently is that of a, a charged non-conducting sheet. What is a charged non-conducting sheet? Non-conducting means it is made of a non-conducting material, which could be, for example, wood. Okay. It could be, for example, uh, paper. Okay. It could be paper. It could be plastic. Okay. All of these are examples of non-conducting sheet. Now suppose that I bring such a sheet and somehow I can place charges on it. I can implant charges on it. What will be the electric field produced by this sheet at points that surround the sheet on both sides of the sheet? It can be left, right. It can be like this up and below. Now let us assume for simplicity that this sheet is infinite. It goes from plus minus infinity in the two directions. This is not a bad assumption because if I am looking for uh, the electric field at a point here, which is very close to uh, the, the sheet, the distance here is much less than the dimension of the sheet. So the sheet looks like infinite compared to this distance here. So what will be the electric field lines associated with this one? We will see the electric field magnitude later on, but now we are just talking about the electric field lines. Well, here is the sheet, okay? This is the sheet. And now I am looking this way, from this side. Of course, it is very thin. It doesn't have any thickness, but just to see the things. So I will look from this side. What will I see? I will see the sheet. Here is the sheet. And the charges are within the sheet. So the situation will look like this. Here is the sheet going plus minus infinity. And here are the charges. Let's say that they are positive charges. And what I want to do is to find the electric field at this point due to this sheet. So let's take this point here and see what electric field does it produce at this one. Apply the procedure we saw at the beginning. Connect the charge to the point with a straight line. Bring 
a positive test charge Q here, place it at this point, and see what happens. The positive will see the positive, and it will be repelled from it. So this is the electric field that is produced by that charge at this point. Now, opposite to this, you can see we have this point here, okay, which is the same distance from the point at which we want to find the field as that one. So now again, we connect it with a straight line, put a positive test charge here. What will this do to it? It will repel it. So the electric field will be in that direction. And here are the two electric fields produced by these two charges at the point where we want to find the field. Since the two charges are equal and they are the same distance from the point where we want to find the field, these two electric fields will have the same magnitude. But now see the directions. Resolve them into components. You can see that the Y component of this is upward, the Y component of this is downward, the Y components will cancel. What about the X components? The X component due to this one is to the right. The X component due to this one is also to the right. So the electric field, the X components of the electric fields add up together. And therefore, the net electric field at this point here, due to this, will be pointing to the right. Okay? We are done with these details, and that's what we get. For every point here, there is an opposite point here that will cancel the Y component and superimpose the X component. If you go to a different point, you will have the same story. This way, this way, this way, and this way. So from here, we can see that the electric field lines associated with a charged non-conducting sheet look like this. They are parallel lines, parallel to each other, but they are perpendicular to the sheet itself. They go like this. Here is the sheet, and these are the electric field lines associated with this sheet. If the sheet is positive, the lines will point away from the sheet. You can see that. If the sheet is negative, the lines will still have this shape, but they will be pointing inward toward the sheet itself. And that's how we determine the electric field due to an infinite non-conducting sheet. Now we are in a position to determine mathematically the electric field that is produced by a point of charge. <clears throat> so let us find that. The electric field due to a point of charge. <clears throat> this is now section 22-2. And here we want to find the electric field. By the way, we already said it. The symbol for the electric field is capital E. Electric field due to due to a point in charge. So here is what we want to find. <clears throat> what is what is the electric field? Electric field is a vector. You know that to determine a vector, you have to determine its magnitude and direction, two things. So what is the electric field at a distance r? at a distance r from a point a charge q. The situation is here. Here we have the point a charge q and this is the distance or the point I wish I, I wish to find the electric field which is a distance r from q. Apply the procedure. Bring a positive test charge. Place it at the point where we want to find the field. Find the force on it due to this charge. How much is the force? The force is given by Coulomb's law. So place a positive test 
a charge at the distance r at which I want to find the field. Find the electrostatic force on the positive discharge. How much is it? It's K, Q that is producing the field times the discharge divided by R squared. Now find the electric field. How did we define the electric field? The electric field is defined as F over Q0. So whatever you have here, divide it by Q0, and therefore the electric field is, is what is left, K, Q over R squared. Okay? And that's the magnitude of the electric field produced by point charge Q at a distance R from the charge. It is proportional to the charge, naturally, as the charge increases, the electric field increases, and it is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the charge, just like the intensity of sound. As you go away from the charge, the electric field will be weaker. What about the direction? This is the magnitude of the electric field. The direction is determined by the uh, polarity of the charge. If the charge is positive, and here is a positive distance charge, the positive will see the positive, and it will be repelled away from it. So that's the electric field. If I, if I have a negative charge, and bring a positive distance charge, the positive distance charge will be attracted to the negative charge setting the field, <coughs> and therefore, that's the direction of the electric field at that point. Watch an extremely important point. We draw the field where we want to find it. It's very trivial, but the big mistake made by students is that they draw the field at the charge itself. No, you draw the field where you want to find it, not at the location of the charge. So in summary, if like we said before, if the charge is positive, the electric field lines are radially outward. If the charge is negative, they are radially inward. <sighs> now let us generalize this. Instead of a single charge, let's now see the electric field produced by two charges, which is what we call the electric dipole. What is the electric dipole? Well, the electric dipole consists of the following. So this is now the electric field of a dipole, an electric dipole. An electric dipole, di means two. We have quadrupole and we have octopole if we have eight charges. This is just a dipole. The electric dipole consists of two equal but opposite charges. They have the same magnitude of the charge, but one is positive, the other one is negative. And they are separated by a distance d. The electric field produced by these two charges is very complicated. The simple sphere that we have here is now greatly distorted, as we can see in here. So it is very, very difficult to find the electric field of the electric dipole at any point in space. What we will do, what we want to do, is to find the electric field along the axis of the dipole. What is the axis? The axis is the line that connects the two charges. So here are the two charges. This is the line that connects them. Okay, so that is called the axis of the dipole. We only want to consider this line. Find the electric field at any point on this line, but at points that are not between the two charges, away from the charges, either up here or down here but not in between them. So let us select one such, such point, point P, whose location or, or whose distance is distance Z from the midpoint of the dipole. Here is the dipole, and here is the axis of the dipole. This is the midpoint of the dipole. So the point at which we want to find the field is A along the axis, B not between the two charges, C, has a distance z, which, is, which uh, has a distance of z from the midpoint of the two dipoles. What is the electric field of such a point? Well, we just use the electric field of a point in charge in this situation. The electric field at point P, the electric field at point P is the electric field due to the positive charge. Its magnitude is Q. What is the distance? This whole thing is D. 
this is d over 2 okay so it is equal to the distance between the charge and the point is that z minus d over 2 so it will be k q over z minus d over 2 squared this is the electric field produced by the positive charge what about the electric field produced by the negative charge since it is negative we put the negative here it's kq we already took the negative here and then what is the distance up to here it is z and then we have this extra distance to reach the negative charge that is d over 2 so it will be z plus d over 2 squared and therefore what you have to know is to know how much is the magnitude of each charge that is q what's the distance between the two charges and what is the distance of the point at which you want to find the field from the midpoint between the two charges substitute into this equation and find the electric field if the point is here you will reverse the plus and minus here now let's take a special case and the special case is what if the distance z at which we want to find the electric field is much greater than d so let's say that the distance between the two charges is one millimeter and you want to find the field at one meter which is 1000 times the distance between them that's what we have here well if you apply this situation you can uh, use an approximation from calculus maybe you said it in math 102 or math 201 that is called the binomial approximation which applies to the situation it's not our subject here because you have to know series expansions etc but let's take the final answer if this condition is satisfied then the electric field far away from the electric dipole but along the axis is equal to 2k q d divided by z cubed 2k q d divided by z cubed now in our study of dipoles you will find that this product occurs frequently q times d so we will give it a special name and that name is called the electric dipole moment the electric dipole moment and we give it the symbol p it's like the linear momentum but it's not momentum it's a vector and that's its symbol what is it equal to it's a vector so it has magnitude and direction the magnitude of the electric dipole moment is simply the product of q and d this product we call it dielectric dipole moment and its direction goes from the negative to the positive charge watch how it is defined we don't have an option here this is a definition dielectric dipole moment goes from the negative to the positive charge so that's how it is determined and now i can replace this product here by p whenever i'm given an electric dipole i can immediately find the electric dipole moment multiply qd and the direction is from the negative to the positive charge so with this now you can see that the electric field at points far away from the dipole is given by e is equal to 2k p that is p divided by z cubed so the electric field of a pointed charge goes like 1 over r squared whereas the electric field of a dipole goes like 1 over r cubed now we have a situation similar to the comparison between the isothermal and the adiabatic process there we said as the exponent in the denominator increases the curve becomes steeper so if i draw these two electric fields this is one over r squared and this is one over r cubed that i have there the electric field due to the electric dipole will disappear faster okay you can see that it is killed faster than the electric field of a pointed charge the reason is very simple you have positive and negative charges so there will be some cancellation 
they themselves will cancel each other. The one that is closer to the point will be the dominant one, but there is severe cancellation due to the two opposite charges. Let's conclude our discussion today by the superposition principle, a problem or an example that shows us the superposition principle. The superposition principle says if you have more than one point of charge, like we have with the dipole, then the electric field at any point in space is equal to the vector sum of the individual electric fields produced by all the charges. So it is the electric field due to charge one, plus the electric field due to charge two, plus that of charge three, and so on. Add these vectorially to give you the net electric field at point B. Let's now see an example of this superposition principle. And that is this sample problem. This is sample problem 2201. Sample problem 2201. It says the figure shows three particles, Q1, Q2, and Q3, with charges Q1 plus 2Q, whatever Q is. Q2 is minus 2Q, and Q3 is minus 4Q. So these two charges, these two points carry the same charge, but one is positive, the other one is negative. This one is negative and it is double the value of any one of them. Each one of them is separated by a distance d from the origin and each one of them makes an angle of 30 degrees with the respective x-axis. What do we want? We want to find the net electric field, the total the resultant electric field that they produce at the origin. So let's apply the procedure and see how it works. The first step, of course, these are the polarities as given. Q1 is positive, Q2 is negative, Q3 is negative. The first step is to bring a positive tested charge and place it at the point where we want to find the field. Where do we want to find the field? At the origin. So bring the positive tested charge, place it at the origin. We have nothing to do with this. We place it where we want the field, which is the origin. Now ask yourself, what will these charges do to this one? Let's start with Q1. Q1 is positive, and this is positive, so there is a repulsive force. Of course, the force will be along the line, joining the two charges. So here is the electric field along that line but it is repulsive away from that one. This is the electric field produced by Q1 at the origin. What about Q2? Well, this is positive and this is negative, so there will be an attractive force along this line, and therefore, this is the electric field. We will try to attract this to this one, so that is the electric field E2 due to Q2 at the origin. What about that one? positive and negative, we will have an attractive force, so that is the electric field E3. Now we have three vectors. It's now a matter of Physics 101, Chapter 3. Given three vectors, find the resultant. We know how are they directed, we know the angles. Now let's find the magnitudes and add them victorially. The magnitude of an electric field due to a point of charge is Kq over R squared. So, the electric field due to a charge 1 is KQ1 divided by R1 squared. R1 is the distance between Q1 and the origin. Let's put these. This is K. How much is Q1? Q1 is 2Q. <coughs> 2Q and its distance is D, D squared. So this is 2kq over d squared. E2 is kq2 divided by r2 squared, which is k into how much is q2? 2q. Forget about the sign. We already took care of it. Now I just want the magnitude. The magnitude is 2q 
and its distance is d squared. So this is again 2kq over d squared. E3 is equal to kq3 divided by r3 squared. How much is q3? q3 is 4q. So this is 4q and the distance is again d squared. So this is 4kq over d squared. These are the magnitudes. Now find the x component of the net electric field. Ex is equal to E1x plus E2x plus E3x. Are they all positive? Yes. This will give me a positive component and this will give me positive components. They are all in the positive x direction. How much is this? The x component of a vector is the vector times cosine of the angle. In this case, all of them have an angle of 30 degrees. So E1 cosine of 30 degrees plus E2 cosine of 30 degrees plus E3 cosine of 30 degrees. Take the 30 degrees as a common factor and what do you have? E1 plus E2 plus E3 into cosine of 30 degrees. Add the magnitudes, 2 plus 2 plus 4 is 8. So this is 8kq over d squared cosine of 30. That's the x component of the electric field. What about the y component? The same thing. Ey is equal to E3y, that is positive, e 3y minus these two will give me negative y components. So e1y minus e2y. This is e3 sine of 30 degrees, e1 sine of 30 degrees, e2 sine of 30 degrees. Take sine 30 as a common factor and you have e3 minus e1 minus e2 into sine of 30 degrees. It is this minus this. 4 minus 2 minus 2, 0. So the net electric field does not have a y component. And therefore, we write it finally, victorially, as the electric field at the origin is equal to this in the positive x direction. So it is 8kq cosine of 30 degrees divided by d squared in the positive x direction. That's the unit vector i. And with this, we conclude our discussion of the electric field due to pointed charges, including the electric field due to an electric dipole.